Every year at this time, I like to take some time just to um, share some visionary ideas. For a number of months, the elders and I have been really praying about what God has for our church in this next chapter as we're going forward and how our ministry should look. So keep praying for us. This is an ongoing sort of discussion that we're having. For now, God has really been speaking to us about living out our identity as his community, right? As a community of believers here in this city. And so I have some thoughts on my heart that I'm really kind of bursting to share today. And so I want to ask you to turn to Luke chapter 5 in your Bible. Go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 5 or on your device. And we're going to read a passage and then we're going to talk about this today. And I hope that I can challenge you with some thoughts that uh, God would want you to hear today. All right, so Luke chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse 33. It's not going to be on the board, so um, open your Bible or find that in your device, okay? Luke 5, 33, and it says, it's a question about fasting, and they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. Let's take a second and pray. Father, we uh, are gathered here together at the beginning of a new ministry season at our church, and we feel the cool temperature signaling the beginning of a new fall season. And the kids are back in school, and we're back at work and back into our routines, and In the midst of all that, Lord, we remember that we are your people and that you have us here for a reason to be your light in this community. And so I pray that as we look at this passage today, a passage that may seem confusing at first, that you would use it to really challenge us and inspire us to be the kind of people that you want us to be in this season, in this time and place. I pray that you would help me to get these ideas across clearly and that you would work in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is the sometimes confusing parable of the wine and the wineskins. And uh, I'm calling this section of the message, could you please set the stage? Because uh, it requires a little bit of backstory. So according to Luke's gospel, these Pharisees asked this question about fasting shortly after they saw Jesus attending Matthew's house party, where he was eating and drinking with sinners, he himself being a tax collector, of course. And they challenged Jesus about eating and drinking with sinners, but Jesus said that the healthy didn't need a physician, only the sick. The Pharisees should have understood that they were part of the sick, but didn't, and so would never receive Jesus' blessing in that way. Well, in that same malicious spirit of trying to trip Jesus up, they then go on to basically ask, why do your disciples eat and drink when the disciples of John fast and often offer prayers? And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. So apparently, Jesus' disciples weren't somber enough. They were not religious enough for these guys. Jesus answers them by way of an illustration, and he uses the example of a bridegroom to do this. He says that while the bridegroom is with the wedding party, right, they don't fast, right? That's not something that they do while they're there together. And so there are some layers to this that I want to unpack for you, just so you can kind of understand Uh, what Jesus was teaching here, because it's not completely straightforward. The first layer is this. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's referring to himself when he refers to this bridegroom. These religious leaders should have picked up on it right away because God often referred to himself as the bridegroom to his people, Israel, in the Old Testament. Look at Isaiah chapter 62. The most famous prophet said, "'For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you.'" And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you, right? And so the bridegroom, God was identified numerous places in the Old Testament as being this bridegroom. Jesus is carrying that language over into the New Testament for himself and 
his church. Jesus is saying that he is the bridegroom and that he is currently with his wedding party. So let me call this next section, you think you know Jewish weddings. You're like, I didn't claim that. (laughs) Well, marriage was interesting in Jewish times when Jesus was here walking the earth. Marriage at that time began with betrothal, usually at the bride's home. And all of these locations and, and details are very important and interesting. It was usually at the bride's home. It was more than just what we call engagement today, with rings being exchanged and vows, and yet still they were not fully married. Very often these were, you know, these betrothals were planned years in advance, often by the parents. Once that betrothal took place, it brought on what was known as the preparation period. It was usually about a year where you were preparing for the finalized wedding. During this time, the groom went back home to prepare a home for his bride. I want you to listen to all of this language. He went back to his home, his father's home, to prepare a place for them to live. This is what he did during that year. And the bride stayed at home with her family, and she got herself ready for the wedding. This is what the custom was. Finally, after a year or so, on the wedding day, the groom and his groomsmen, often referred to as friends of the bridegroom, would leave the groom's home in a festive procession to the bride's house. Typically, it was at evening or, in, or at night that they would do this. And upon arriving, the wedding ceremony would take place, where there would be exchanging of more vows and blessings, possibly the signing of a marriage contract called the ketuba. And this would all happen for the wedding. Then after the ceremony, the bride and groom, along with the wedding party, would typically proceed back to the groom's house or another designated location for the wedding feast. This is how it worked. Now, it's very fascinating, guys. The bridegroom and the bride are actually perfectly paralleled by Jesus and the church in the New Testament. When you actually understand Jewish weddings at the time, and then you see what the Bible says about Christ and the church and what's happening between us, it's really quite amazing. You know, we speak about the church as Jesus' bride, but to be accurate, we are still in that betrothal stage. We are waiting for the bridegroom to return. That's the most accurate understanding of it. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you may have never noticed this, Paul says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. He's talking to the Corinthian believers. Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. You see, even Paul used that language of betrothal. We were in the betrothal period. The actual wedding will come when Jesus returns for us, his bride, and when we are whisked off to the groom and his father's house. Jesus often talked about the great wedding feast that would take place in his kingdom. It's very interesting when you understand Jewish weddings. And so you can see the imagery lines up perfectly. You even think of John chapter 14, when Jesus was speaking to his disciples before going away, he said, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you, uh, take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. This is exactly what happened in a Jewish marriage scenario, right? So right now, We are his bride. We are making ourselves ready as we wait for him to return for the actual wedding. This is what the Bible teaches. So that's one layer. But then there's a second layer going on in what Jesus is describing here. And that is that fasting is related to sorrow, not joy. John the Baptist's disciples, who were mentioned here, right? The Pharisees said, John the Baptist's disciples, they fast. Well, John the Baptist's disciples would have fasted in sorrow over their sins because he was preaching a message of repentance. They also would have fasted when John was imprisoned because that was also a very sorrowful thing. Jesus compared his own disciples to friends of a bridegroom who were happy to be with him while they could be. It was not a time for fasting. It was a time for joy. This is the point that Jesus is making to them. Weddings were week-long celebrations. It wasn't a time for fasting. Jesus certainly believed in fasting. He did it himself, and he even taught it to his disciples, but they would fast after Jesus left them, and we know that to be true. The big point, here's the big point that he's making in this first half of this passage, and that is there's a time and a place for everything. This is what Jesus is saying indirectly. And with that idea in mind, he now transitions into a parable that is going to illustrate that there is a time and a place for everything. Keep that idea in your head as he moves into this discussion on the wine and the wineskins. All right, verse 36, he says, No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the new will not match the old. 
And so think about it. A new garment has never been washed. And so it has never been shrunk. It has never been faded. We love wearing new clothes, right? Because they haven't shrunk yet. And right, they haven't faded. They look beautiful. That's new clothing, right? Um, If you take a piece of cloth from a new garment to repair an old one, he says you do two things. First of all, you ruin the new piece, the, the piece of new clothing because you're taking a piece out of it. Why would you do that? And secondly, the new piece of cloth isn't going to match the old clothing because it's new and the old one is old and it's faded, so it's not going to match. And so here's the big idea that he's working at now as he moves through this passage. Mixing the old with the new doesn't always render good results. Doesn't always give you good results. Verse 37 says, No one puts new wine in old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. So in ancient times, goat skins were used to hold wine, right? You would get these fresh skins and you would shape them into these little bottle shapes and they would put the new wine in these. And the fresh grapes, as they fermented in the skins, they caused the skins to expand and to stretch because they were this, it was this flexible leather, right? So they would stretch. But a used skin, right? A used skin is already stretched. It has dried out. It would burst if you put new wine in it because as the new wine fermented and stretched, there's no flexibility left in old skins. And so they're going to break as the wine expands. And so in verse 38, he says, clearly new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. So again, the idea mixing the old with the new doesn't always render good results. Now I'm going to highlight three big points that Jesus is making here followed by two specific lessons for us, Renew Church, all right? So please follow. Here's the first point. The new thing that Jesus was about to do wasn't going to fit in the old containers of the law. This is the big point that he's making to the Pharisees here when he's teaching about the wineskins. Jesus was introducing the kingdom of God and a new covenant that would be ratified by his own blood. It was a covenant of freedom and of joy And the old forms and structures of the Old Testament, they weren't going to be able to hold this new reality. They just weren't. And so Jesus was warning these religious Pharisees that the life and energy of this new kingdom message could not be held by their old rigid laws. It wasn't going to work. He was saying that the new forms and practices were going to be necessary to carry the good news of the kingdom, this life in the spirit that he was teaching us about. So that's the main idea here in this passage. But again, there are more layers to Jesus' teaching. So here's the second point that I think Jesus was making. New movements in new times require new forms and structures to carry them. It's a more general truth, but it's one that we can make from this passage. The law was his main point, obviously, but Jesus was also teaching that new movements today also require new wineskins. You've probably witnessed this in your own life where at a certain time and place you needed to do things in a new way for a new expression to take place, for it really to capture the spirit of what was happening. In other words, each generation needs to carry out the Great Commission in their own way and in the context where Jesus has placed them. Guys, we have to learn this, this kind of principle of new wine in new wineskins. We have to be understanding that we have our own context here of how we share the gospel with people in this time and in this place. So that's the second point. And the third point is this, and this is in the last verse that he mentions. It is a natural thing to prefer the old things. Verse 39, he says, And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. Many manuscripts actually have the word better there instead of good. The old is better. Even at the wedding of Cana, if you remember that story, they served the old wine first because it was the best until Jesus came along and he made something even better. But that's what you do, right? You serve the old wine first, right? Before people have had a lot to drink and don't notice anymore, right? Um, You're going to serve that old wine because it's the best. You're going to serve it first. And every wine connoisseur knows that old wine is better. Wine gets better with age. So I'm going to invite my friend Francois Bernard to come down at this time and help me out with a little illustration. Francois, come on down. It's on this last layer of teaching that I want to spend the rest of our time here this morning. And I'm no wine connoisseur. Francois would be more of one than I am. But 
I can generally tell a good wine from a bad wine, um, generally, um, but probably not always. And uh, I'm calling this section of the message, it's five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> You're like, oh, this is getting real. Okay, it is gonna get real. Uh, because I am so committed to my task of teaching you, I spent some of my own money, not church money, my own money. In fact, I, I looked for the oldest bottle of wine I could find at the LCBO. It's only 2012. It's not that old, but, you know, it's, it's 12 years old. And I, it's more than I've ever spent on any bottle of wine, okay? And I brought it here just for us today. Well, <laughs> us. <laughs> Don't get the wrong idea. Okay, so... Um, Francois and I were actually just on a bike tour yesterday. I have a little picture here, Francois, that you guys posted online, so I thought I could take it and steal it. Riding bikes, drinking wine combined. What a concept, right? I only fell off my bike once. It was, we had a great day. It was a wonderful day. We, we got to sample some different things as we rode around Niagara and Niagara on the lake. It was wonderful, right? And so, um, We've been to Niagara Falls. We are experts on wine now, okay? Because we, we had a little yesterday. So Francois is, uh, he's opening this bottle for us here. And we're going to see, Francois, if this is actually, I, I know you may be thinking, could this be considered drinking on the job? I will let you decide whether that's true or not. But I want you to know this, because some of you are judging me right now. I want you to know this. I never tasted wine in my life until I went to church right? My wife's church. It was real wine that they served. So the church got me started on this. That's one my point. All right. So let's, let's pour a little here, Francois. Just a splash. It's five o'clock somewhere, right? Apparently you're supposed to like do this and sniff it, I think. Mm. Cheers. Let's give it a shot. What do you think? Beautiful. Honest opinion. Yeah? Can you tell it's like 12 years old? Yes. <laughs> Very good. Give, give Francois a big hand for his help here this morning. Very good. Now, the point is, that is actually really good. Old wine is better. Everybody knows that the old wine is better. New wine and wineskins is all about doing things in a new way for a current time and place and people, all right? That's the point that's being made here. The new covenant was the prime example of this, and Jesus alludes to that here. Jesus is the eternal propitiation for sins, right? Him writing his law on our hearts, making the old forms and structures of the law obsolete, Right? The Old Testament law could no longer contain this new covenant. And the Bible says that we are ministers of this new covenant. We are Christ's ambassadors, taking this timeless message and sharing it to people in this time and in this place. And as we do this, the principle of new wine applies to us as well. The wine represents the new thing that God is doing, and we need to keep packaging it in skins that can hold it, that can contain this reality. In fact, when you really think about it, if we're trying to match up the metaphors, right, the church is really the new wineskin. The church is the wineskin. We are the container that holds the precious wine of what God is doing. And as the church, our essence never changes, but our expression, the way we do things, needs to constantly change to be effective in new contexts. This is really important to grasp. And so here's lesson number one for Renew Church as we go through this. Lesson number one is we need to adapt to this new time and place that we are in, right? Things have changed a lot in 27 years since I moved here to the GTA. I can tell you, things have changed a lot. And a lot of that change has happened just in the last five years or so. You really only have a few options, guys, when you're talking about adapting to the culture around you and adapting to things changing around you, all right? And I've seen all of these responses. The first response is just move away, right? Say, no, this, is, this isn't for me anymore. Move away somewhere where it's more comfortable for you. That's one. 
The second thing you can do is just sort of bury your head in the sand and ignore the new realities. Say, well, I'm just going to do my thing. I'm going to ignore everything else that's kind of happening around me. Uh, I'll do my thing. That's another strategy. But then the third, what I would say is the biblical strategy, is we can start making new wine in new wineskins. The things that worked to lead people to Jesus 25 years ago, they're not going to work the same way anymore. They're just not. We have to acknowledge this. We need our younger members to lead us in understanding how to reach the millennials and reach Generation Z. We need our international members to help us understand how to reach immigrants. We need people who came to Christ out of other faiths to help us understand how to reach people in those faiths. We need new wine in new wineskins. All of us need to pray for the Spirit's guidance and his wisdom, and for our passion to be renewed as we do this. Guys, wine is also a metaphor for joy in the Old Testament, and the fermentation symbolizes the passion and energy that always accompanies something new, these new ideas and these new methods. We need that passion and that energy in this time and place as we move forward. Renew Church, I would say it this way, it's time to make new wine. It's time to make new wine. And so let's be enthusiastic as we adapt to the culture around us, as we see what's happening, and as we react to that. So that's the first lesson. The second lesson for Renew, this should actually be self-evident, but a lot of people miss it. We all agree that the old wine is better. I'm going to have a little bit more of this. This is very good. Mm -hmm. That's better than the $10 bottle, $10 bottle of Jackson Triggs, I have to admit. We all agree that the old wine is better, but let's be clear, Jesus doesn't even argue that fact here, right? He's not arguing that. In fact, he seems to agree with this principle. There were some very rich and nostalgic aspects even of the Old Testament law. Do you ever think about that? We, we kind of put the law down a lot because we talk about the new covenant, but the fact is, if you were living in it, there were a lot of very rich images in it, very nostalgic pieces to it. The recitations, the gatherings, the religious trappings, the feasts particularly. We did two Seder services during lockdown. You can, any of you remember us doing that? Two Seder services. You, a lot of you participated from home. You can see how powerful a celebration that is. You can see how that would become a thing that you do year over year and it would just get richer over time. And so guys, we all have these kinds of traditions in our lives, customs that we really cherish deeply. Right? Rituals around how you celebrate Christmas or how you celebrate birthdays or you know, different family gatherings that you do on a regular basis. You cherish these things. Every year, there's like a new layer added to it, more history. And you, every time you get together, you tell the stories from the events past. It becomes very rich. And these are old rituals. They're, they're rich and they're complex. They're like wine. right? They just keep getting better with age. The stories keep getting exaggerated. Right? And it's so good. And then someone retells the story and you're like, this gets better every time they tell it, right? We never want to stop having that old wine. And so lesson two, which should be obvious, but it's not to so many people. This is a lesson for us, Renew. The only way to keep enjoying old wine is to keep making new wine, right? It seems so obvious. So simple, but so profound. You know, in the early days of our church, we made so much new wine. That's one of the things I love about church planting. When you start a church, it's all new. You're just, you're just cranking out new wine. Everything that you do is new. And it's exciting. And it's, there's energy to it and passion. We had Canada Day carnivals. We had, we had over 5,000 people in the community showing up at some of these carnivals that we put on. Church that we did in mobile locations and schools, setting up and tearing down. Thousands of services, Right? classes that we held, weekly group meetings, ministry efforts that we did together, retreats that we would hold. I still think back to some of those retreats over 20 years ago and think, oh, that was, that was so awesome. Special events, street parties that we've done, trunk or treat, right? We got that coming up again. Um, just informal get-togethers too. Not even stuff necessarily that was, you know, programmed by the church, just people getting together and doing stuff, kind of like we did in Niagara yesterday. Like just this kind of life that was happening. These habits became the very fabric of our lives. 
when I think of all that, I, that's not just stuff that happened. That was my life. It was all of that. And it was so amazing. And over the years, I can tell you guys, that wine has aged beautifully. In the moment when you're setting up and tearing down, it's not really that fun, okay? But 27 years later, when you look back and you say, those were good times, right? Our family gets together now, and our kids tell stories about stuff that they remember, going back years, many years. Our photo albums, we don't have a lot, we have more boxes filled with photos, right? up till a certain point when we got the cell phones and it ruined all that. But we have these boxes full of pictures. You just go through them and it's capturing all of the fabric of that life that I just described, of all of those things that we were doing, all of that new wine that we were making. You see it in every picture. It's just like, oh, here's those guys and these guys. And it was all right there. I'm so happy today because I can tell you, I have so much old wine in my life. Not, not literal, okay? The, don't, don't isolate that clip, okay? <laughs> but I have so much old wine. Beautiful memories over the past 27 years. Highs and lows. Memories that are rich and complex and heartwarming. And honestly, they're priceless. They really are. And I'm actually at the age now where I could just sip on that old wine for the rest of my days. I've made enough to keep living on it, right? My, my cellar is full again, not literal don't isolate that clip. But you understand, I, my life is so rich. I have so much of that in my life. I can literally just sink, sit down and think at any moment and about stuff that's happened and have these heartwarming thoughts. Look at old pictures. Honestly, guys, I could live without ever making any new wine for myself. I could live with that at this stage in my life. I don't want to, and I enjoy making new wine, but I could because I have so much. But here's the thing that I couldn't do. I couldn't live with knowing that our younger members won't have what I've had. That I can't live with. And I look around at so many of you younger members here and I think, I want so badly for you to have what I have. I'm trying to put it into words for you and it's difficult. It is so rich. It is so beautiful. It is so fulfilling. And I fear sometimes that our younger members won't have the same thing. It would break my heart for my own kids to not be able to experience this. And I think they will because they've gotten enough of a taste of it already. I think they've been ruined, which is good. But it would break my heart for your kids not to experience it. It would break my heart for you younger members who are under 35 years old at our church, right? It would break my heart for you not to experience it. Gen Y and Z. You know, guys, life in Christ's community is so rich, it just gets better with age. But the only way that you can enjoy old wine someday is if you keep making new wine today. It's the only way you can do it. Now, I can't lie. Making new wine, it costs something. It really does. Think about the image of winemaking, right? It's, it's a grape being crushed, right? It's the juice coming out as it's being crushed. Making new wine always costs. In the moment, it's always hard work, right? There's difficulty that you have to push through. It's not always going to be fun and pleasant. You're going to need to commit, and you're going to need to be faithful. You know, I, sometimes I get tired just thinking about all of the things that our congregation has been through over the years, right? I think of the victories, I think about groups of young people getting together after movies in the park and standing in a circle and praying, right? It's so awesome. I, I think about hundreds of people showing up to a fall kickoff that we've done. I think about dozens of baptisms, just so many people being baptized. I also think about the defeats and losses that we've had over the years, right? Certain people have passed away. There have been sicknesses. There have been failures. There have been painful departures. Some people spiritually have gone astray. I, I think many times of being with people in some of their darkest moments. I remember the fun things, too. I remember 
Ken Tyndale leaving a toilet on my lawn. Not once, not twice, but thrice. With the help of his son now. See, this is how this stuff goes. I remember toilet papering someone's house just on a whim one night years ago. It was great. I remember Mitch in one of our staff meetings wearing his Netflix and chill shirt, not having a clue what that meant. I remember beyond the fun times, remember the best times. And the best times are seeing people come to know Jesus, seeing lives transformed. And not just lives, but generations. Right? I remember many years ago when Eric and Carmen Ting came to know Jesus. We didn't know if it was ever going to happen. Eric was kind of stubborn. But now I look today and his boys, right? Brandon and Jamie, you've both heard them up here recently talking about the stuff that they're doing in ministry. It doesn't get better than that. It's so good. It's so rich. It really is. And through all of these times, guys, joyful and difficult, what happens is, as we're doing God's work together, we bond together. We have a word for this in our values list. It's the last one. It's the word communitas, right? This is what it is. It's the community, this powerful community that's formed when people are doing something difficult together, when you're in the trenches together, the bonds that are formed, and they're lifelong, and they're powerful. We made so much wine in the early years. I still drink from it today, as I said. It is so rich, and old wine is so good, and I want it so badly for every one of you here, especially you younger people. But it's going to cost you something, and what it costs you is commitment. That's the crushing. It's the commitment. Did you know that our membership requirements of Renew Church are actually designed to make sure that you invest in the future, to make sure that you are making new wine? That's literally what they are, right? Worshiping together every Sunday, right? Being at group each week, serving as much as you can, giving as you're able, and working to share the good news with other people. It's all making new wine. That's what it is. That's the reason why we make you do it. <laughs> it's because we want you to have old wine someday. Paul talked about being poured out like a drink offering for his brothers and sisters in Philippians chapter 2. Guys, here's a fact. Making new wine requires surrendering your own life to the greater community. We talk a lot about surrendering to God, and that's very important. We don't talk enough about surrendering to your brothers and sisters, to the community that God has given to you. And in the moment, that always seems like a bad idea, right? Especially for this generation that really wants to keep its options open. It's not FOMO anymore, it's FOBO, it's fear of a better offer, right? So it's like, I don't want to commit to anything because something better may come along. Guys, I'm telling you, that's a lie from Satan. It's going to ruin your life. It's going to keep you from ever having good old wine to sip on. You need to commit. You need to commit and surrender to the greater community around you. Trust me on this one. It is what you want. It is what you want. And I know that runs contrary, like I said, to today's ideas of keeping your options open. But that's a lie. The best life is found in sacrificing for the greater community. You younger members, let me say it this way. This is your time. This is your time where you need to take the lead in making new wine in our church. Show us the new wineskins. Take the lead, right? Show us how to do this in your generation. I'll say it again. It is time to make new wine. Guys, this is going to be a year of refocusing on our community, relearning how to engage people here. We're going to commit to living and working together as brothers and sisters, living together in vital community. We're going to keep engaging our younger leaders and empowering them more. We're going to keep doing that. We're going to reignite the Spirit's fire in our hearts, guys. We need the Spirit of God as we make new wine. Join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. at Cineplex Cinemas in Milton. Or visit us online at renewchurch.ca connect.